Thank you so much, Joanne, for asking us uh, to have this conversation. It's a real pleasure to talk to Alfred and Martha. Um, I think that since Joanne has introduced you both, I don't need to do a more formal introduction. Um, but uh, I do just want to, I'd love to begin by um, asking you both about the beginning. In a way, on paper, it seems like an unlikely pairing because Alfred, uh, your work, at least that your, your, your plays, are um, uh, rooted in a kind of psychological realism. Um, in a way, they're, they're rooted in uh, very political situations. Uh, you write about anti-Semitism and racism. Um, and of course, your best known plays are all set in, in Atlanta and the South. Um, but Martha, your work is dreamlike and expressionistic and uh, not always based in narrative. In fact, sometimes seems to be um, very much not about narrative. And so it's, it's, it's curious in a way that you work together on this project. And Alfred, the, the idea initially, I think, was yours. I, uh, yeah, I had a house one summer many years ago with my family up in uh, New York State, just across the line from uh, the Hancock Shaker Village. And we had little kids, and we had to do something every day. So I went over there a lot. And I became interested in Shaker history. And I started reading about Mother Anne Lee, who was the founder of the Shakers. I, don't, I can't see any of them. So uh, I don't know how much you all know about the Shakers. Uh, I can just tell you that Mother Anne Lee, in the latter half of the 18th century, in New England, mostly in Massachusetts, uh, founded a sect of people and her main belief was completed under celibacy. The only way you could get into heaven was to be celibate. She preached this, she got converts, and uh, to make a long story short, there were little colonies. So they practiced this. The only thing that would be the same And I thought this would make a hell of a theater piece. <laughs> but I realized that immediately it wasn't a play. Why? Because it's like way out on the end of the diving board. It's very strange. And these shakers, while they never had sex, they did have meetings at night where they would pass around spiritual wine, which is no wine at all, and get drunk. And they would be 
visited by people like Pope Pius IX and Christopher Columbus and Eskimos and all kind of people. And they would speak to them in their native languages. And they believed that if you were naked, you were invisible. So according to the testimonies, they hooted and tooted and ran around naked like hoot owls. And how do you put that in play? <laughs> so I thought about it for many years, and I met Martha. I loved her work. Seven years ago Thursday. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thanksgiving we party. Met we met on July 4th that year. But I liked her, and I loved her work, and uh, I accosted her at this party. And why did she seem the right collaborator for you? Because I loved her work. She just seemed so out there with her work and so brave about doing stuff. And it just spoke to me. I, I can't tell you. It didn't look like choreography to me. <laughs> I've got, I know some other people too. <laughs> it didn't look like, I mean, I'm, I'm not, my wife is a balletto man, but I am not. And uh, it didn't look like the New York City Ballet to me. And I was, I just wanted to see what she would do. And she looked sort of polite, because she's a lady. And she said, yes. And it's like, oh my God, who is he? And what is he talking about? But we started meeting about it, and we could pick up. What did you pick up? He um, told me to read a book called Anne the Word, and the story of Anne Lee and trying to get this religious sect established and the difficulties they had and the kind of clarity and strength of her vision was uh, terribly interesting, and there were wonderful anecdotes about it. And I think that I have been, uh, my, in the dance world, I'm kind of a little bit like a mongrel. You know, I, I love the theater and I love dance. And I, I often say that I direct dancers and choreograph on actors. I like working with all kinds of performers. And anyway, I think that the, as we read about the music and the possibility of pattern and rhythm, which is something that had not been my strong suit. It attracted me to work um, on elements in choreography and composition that I hadn't really tackled. My work, for me at least, has been you know highly imagistic and I try to load images, but this was straightforward worship through rhythm. And that seems a worthy door to open. Hmm. <laughs> and so how did the, how did the collaboration Proceed of you wrote a you wrote a, a Lunch. script. We we talked a lot, <laughs> and uh, luckily, or I, I think yes, now I guess it was lucky. I wasn't so sure. A very few months later, Andre Bishop and Lincoln Center gave us uh, a rehearsal space and time. We were at two different periods. We were in the basement of Lincoln Center for ten weeks, working on this, yeah. and we started off with a fairly biographical piece. We had a wonderful actress. We had Francis B. Dorman, who Mother and Ann Lee, and we had- uh, Michael Stuhlbar, Michael Stuhlbar from A Serious Man. Piece. We had top flight actors. But, and, and a few dancers. But it became apparent after a while that it was not exactly that kind of a show, that it, it seemed to require mostly movement and not so much plot. And so you drafted a you drafted a play with a with a with a structure and a sort of that very half-assed play. It wasn't really a play. I don't. Know, it was a kind of a play, but it had this structure that was very inhibiting as far as how to talk about the Shakers, and it had a lot of plot points. And she indeed lived a fascinating life. While she was preaching celibacy, she was married, and her husband was with her all the time. But of course they were celibate, and uh, we had to drop that part of it because it just was too much to go into. So fortunately for us, Andre Bishop said, this is not for my audience, and we're not going to do it. And so that was, we thought, 10 weeks down the drain. But you know, about a year later? Then, no, actually it's a few years. Yeah, you're right. Pick it up. Um, in the summer of 2009, Oh, no, come on, it was before that. Was that when you went to 
Yeah, we went to the Berkshire Theater Good. Festival. Well, one of my dancers, uh, Isadora Wolf, who's an NYU master's graduate student, beautiful girl who, when you all see the production, she's the one who, well, I guess I shouldn't tell. <laughs> she's the um, body one. At any rate, we went up for a week to the Berkshires, and um, they did not pay us, but they gave us a studio. And um, my assistant, Gabby Malone, who used to dance with Twyla Tharp, fell wildly in love with pounding riddens out on the floor. And I wanted to do two pieces that week, and Gabby and I got into a terrible fight. This is really true. Um, she said, we're just getting the feel for this. You can't move on the other material. I want, it's like I wanted to clean out the kitchen, you know, throw out this box of cereal and this. But um, she, we had this terrible fight, and I said, OK, we'll s just do shakers this week. Then Alfred came up, really and cool. he said, oh, this is really interesting. I, the I wasn't sure I wanted to go through it again. It was kind of like getting breaking up and going back together. But it wasn't so much you Not, and me. No, you and I were fine. We never had a problem. We just, I just didn't know what to do with it. Martha said, Martha's a very, very, very determined woman. And she said, we should make a movie of it. And I thought, yeah, well, how are we going to do that? Well, we have to do that. So I was thinking about that. And then when I came up to the park, I can't believe it was just two and a half years ago. And then we went to the American Dance Festival and put it on in 2010. We opened the festival and had three performances. And we were deeply encouraged by audience response. We have an exceptional company. We have dancers for, uh, from Bill T. Jones, Twyla, Martha Graham, Paul Taylor, Patrick Corbin, who dance people would know. Um, and then some actors as well. And we have a wonderful actress. We have a new actress who joined us in mid-September named Birgit Hupak, who got an OB last year for the telephone. Mm. And her brother William, who is a major character in, in our evening, is a lead performer with Blue Man Group. So it's a, a very unusual group. We hired a wonderful vocal coach from NYU because these dancers had never spoken or sang before. And they sing the whole score a cappella. And they act. And they act. They, the piece is put together with testimonies. Um, always when you make something, it's a big process of illumination. And the shakers were persecuted from the outside. And we didn't have enough money to have persecutors and shakers. <laughs> so that what you do is you begin finally, like carving marble, to find the vein that you can follow and be true to. And it was, for opera time, it was a lot of cutting away material to find out what the real armature of the piece would be. And we were very lucky that the 11 people who were doing it are gifted. And I think we both, and Arthur, our musical director, tailored the piece to these 11 people. Uh, I'm, and having done that, I've done things like that before, the piece then becomes available to other people. But it was really specifically tailored to these 11 people and what their lives were. And I just sort of made testimonies that I took from Shaker history that sort of seemed to fit in with them. Arthur crafted, you know, there are thousands of Shaker songs. Six little thousand. Little, <laughs> thousands. He picked, what, do we have 20, maybe? Yeah, about and He picked the 20 and arranged them so that these non-singers would sound good. And I assume Martha did the same thing with her, with her movement thing. She did it for these people. But it's, it's been interesting because it is mostly rhythmic. Um, because men and women couldn't touch. I often like to do lifts and kind of vaguely erotic work. And this is about repression. And repression actually is sexy. <laughs> um, and we have very few colors in the piece. I mean, it's a very, very small vocabulary in a sense that's really mined over and over again through rhythm. Uh, I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to, to, to come back to what you were beginning to say about how you compose, both of you, because you both, of course, I mean, composition is, is, uh, is so different in a way, I suppose, for a, for a writer and a choreographer, but you both start from, from uh, a kind of void, from a blank. A blank page, uh, and uh, Alfred, you you've already suggested that you that a lot of the piece, a lot of the language in the piece comes from testimony. 
is, yeah. is almost all of it, in fact, found from various sources? Or it's what all. Was your, what was your job in the end? It's all based on testimonies. About 30 or 35 percent of it is really Shaker stuff. But I crafted that too. Uh, so again, like we have a wonderful African American dancer, Whitney, and Whitney just fell in naturally. They they took a lot of runaway slaves. So I wrote a piece that the idea came from Frederick Douglass. He said I used to play pray with my heart, and then I learned to pray with my legs, yeah. and which really got me, so yeah. I just expanded on that for Whitney. And what's that dance called that he does it? Juba. Juba. And it's, it's improvised. It's all, well, it's all funny. He, this is the only piece that's full. It's not fully improvised there, um, but I never quite know what he's going to do. And it was wonderful to let this really gifted performer just be free. And there are a few bases he has to get to so people know when to stop clapping, <laughs> that kind of thing. But uh, he was incredible yesterday. <laughs> he had something new happen. <laughs> and, and, and Martha, how do you, how do you compose? How do you, uh, when the, the first, day, my pants. <laughs> first, first day, first day of a, of a workshop on a new piece with a, a group of dancers, do you, do you come in with a lot of material? You've done, your work is, is often very based on research, most of it's. I did a lot of reading and I love the reading. In fact, I'm still reading on the Shakers. Um, a wonderful book called The Great Divorce that came out last spring because the, the writer got in touch with me last week because she's very excited about the fact that we were doing this. I do a lot of research. I look at film. I read history. I listen to things. I look at pictures. I look at photographs. I sometimes will be watching a French film and I'll see a gesture and I'll write it down. I'll say that might be quite good for the shaker. So it's a little bit like being a magpie and finding silver buttons and pieces of string. <laughs> and um, I work very much out of the moment. It's very intuitive. I don't prepare things before I go, but I come in prepared to work, but without often specific ideas. It takes maybe a month of sketching, of just playing around, of making a good atmosphere for performers to feel they can fail, nobody's looking for uh, results or even a, a, anything specific. I really just play and then it's funny because I look back on my notes and the first day it's like a, an artist with a piece of charcoal. The first stroke on the page actually begins to push the piece. And if uh, I think over years I used to get very freaked out about having to start, but I realized that the more relaxed I can be and making as good an atmosphere as I can for performers to improvise and be involved in the creative process. First of all, it makes the process wonderful, but we do, we finally get a piece. Mm. Uh, Alfred, what most, now that you look at the piece, um, it's presumably moved in a direction that is quite far from your original conception. Yeah, it would have scared the hell out of me. What, um, <laughs> <laughs> what, what scared the hell out of you? She just spit at me. <laughs> What surprised you most when you when you saw the piece? Oh, I think incarnation. What surprised me the most is that I could be that fluid, that I I could get into it that much. You see, my my before I was a playwright, I was a lyricist. Lyricist, and my experiences was with musical theater, which is very collaborative. So I was very kind. I collaborated with choreographers in that sense, but that was strictly you know, on the count of two. You turn around and you kick and. Not anything. I didn't know what they were talking about. Shot say, shot say. I didn't know what they were talking about. But uh, this, it turned out that Martha and I, although our disciplines are wildly different, and I'm a cheap showbiz type, and she's an arty, arty, whatever she is. Uh, <laughs> but we're very much alike. We come from the same kind of background. We have the same sense of humor. We have very much alike, and. It was just fun to, we just had fun a lot. We never had a fight, we never had an argument, which it's in all true. this time. Yeah. And we is, that, is the piece, is, does the piece live up to your initial fantasy? Does it, are there points of intersection where it I think it's more, Kitty, and I think it's more than what I thought it was gonna be, because it's rich and it's deep, and I found 
once we started working on it at Lincoln Center, for a while, you know, you can't help feeling smirky about people who have given up sex. Like, what are they thinking? Are they, you know, are they kidding? Not that we're all such sex hounds, but completely no sex, not even with yourself, nothing at all. And uh, they were very adamant about that. And I went from smirky to really finding that's a very brave commitment to make. To really, to really say you're going to do something like that. I thought a lot about, oh, I don't know, being 18 years old and being in college and how if there hadn't been sex in my life. You wouldn't have four daughters. I wouldn't have four daughters, but I <laughs> would have learned a lot. I mean, I think when you're, at least when I was young, it was just what pushed me along all the time. Mm. And still, in a way, always does. And to, to think, just not to have that be a part of my life. To, I, I also realize, and I say this a lot because I realize it, everybody's had their body taken somewhere they didn't want to go at one time or another in some kind of way. And so Ann Lee just used that. Mm. And also, in the 18th century, there was strong belief in heaven and hell. And she said, if you do it, you're going to go to hell. And if you don't do it, you're going to go to heaven. And both these things are sure. So, but the fluidity of the piece and myself is what made me happy. What was the greatest challenge for you with this piece? Oh, it was putting it together. Yeah. You get, the way I work, I, it's like collecting pieces of glass on the beach and then making a collage with it. Uh, it's finding out the way in which to stitch. There's speech, song, dance, song, speech. It's finding the rhythms and, and how to make the connection, how to get rid of the seams. It's always, my process, usually the first third is very joyous and fun, and then the next half is agony. <laughs> then the last bit, is fun again because you can think about lighting and color and costume and final presentation. I always start off having a good time and then there is a certain point in the process where it's you you know, you have all this information but it hasn't kind of landed into a shape. Mm. And finding the shape with enough colors in it because I tend to like very dramatic things it's letting go, so there's humor. This is a pretty dark piece, and I, I often do dark work, but this is darker than usual. <laughs> we, uh, we, have some, we have some video of, of from a, a couple of uh, previous yeah. uh, pieces of Martha. Should we, should we look at some of them? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I brought in, I guess there's a garden. What, could you start with the garden lighting rehearsal? I don't care, start wherever you want. I just thought it would be, I thought it would be a good idea for us to be able to... Have some of you seen Garden of Earthly Delights? Yeah. Right. Okay, um, this is from the Minetta Lane. Um, it was actually before we got to Minetta Lane. It was a uh, London you rehearsal see, in New Jersey. Maybe we could dim the... If we, we could, could take this light off, off. yeah. This is, this is hell, so we're starting a nice dark area. <laughs>
skip on to Vienna or? It's very dark. See, I've only seen it on my computer. So. It'll be the next chapter is Vienna, and we can move through that and then get to more lyrical flying. Uh, this was done at New York Theatre Workshop in 2002. And I think these little pieces were put together for grant applications, so they're not, um, you know, I don't know what I was trying to show. <laughs> this was done in collaboration with Charles Mee. Playwright? You know, if the sound's not better, oh, there it goes. Definitely not shaker. <laughs> uh, do you want to move on to the boot piece? Just go fast forward a bit. There you go. Just, we'll just watch a minute or two of this. Uh, <laughs> she, she's in the Shaker piece. She's my assistant, Gabby Malone. Wonderful dancer.
Uh, should we start? Sure. Yeah. Great. Great. Quite different Thank than you. what you'll see next well, week. Well, <laughs> you, you say that, but actually I was thinking as I watched it that, that so much of your work is about the unconscious uh, and about a dream life and a kind of wildness. Uh, uh, it's in a way about the, it, your work is always very much about the id, I think, as opposed to the ego. And when I saw, uh, when I saw Angel Reapers in rehearsal, it occurred to me that one of the things that you were exploring in a way was the unconscious desire of the Shakers and a kind of wildness and a mania um, in, in, in the life of the Shakers too. Is that right? That's, that's in the DNA of the piece. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. So it, uh, it I, and I, because before I saw you in rehearsal, mm -hmm. I thought, what? Why is Martha interested in the Shakers? We think of the Shakers as being so, so arid and so minimalist and so, uh, uh, and so uh, proper in a way. But it seems to me that in this piece, what you're really tapping into is uh, uh, the a un underbelly. The underbelly, a kind of insanity. Um, That's why. My instinct was not not to write a play and to approach Martha, but this was years of thinking, and uh, I was terrified. It's just what it means. It's it's to me. It's about what happens when one denies oneself something that's a part of human nature. So. The fire can't get out, but the smoke is going to come out of somebody's ear or somebody's thing. It's going to come out, and it was the way, and the way that it comes out is that's Martha's department. And <laughs> <laughs> it almost it almost seems to me. I mean, I don't I don't want to talk about the piece too much because of course none of you have seen it yet. But but if if Shakers dreamt, this would be their dream, in a way. Poor gears. <laughs> <laughs> um, in a moment, uh, I'd love to open this up and, and make this a conversation with all of you so you have a chance to ask questions to, to, to Martha and, and, and to Alfred. But um, are dreams, are your own dreams important in your work? I don't know, because I... Have you ever staged I, a dream of yours? I actually did a piece a year ago, exactly, at the University of Iowa. I was commissioned by the science program, and I did it on memory and dreams, which is awfully big. And I interviewed many neuroscientists, Jungian, Freudian, and I, I didn't get anything from these people, actually. They were all crazy. Interesting, like I, I went and talked to the head of the sleep clinic, and he had an electric guitar in his office, and he was more interested in talking about his guitar um, but I found great writing in Proust, in Kafka, in Lewis Carroll, and in Dostoevsky. And we took third person <coughs> literature and turned it into first person text. And it's a piece I actually want to continue. It was called In the Night, and it was about dreams, really. Um, yeah, I've always been interested. I can't even verbal. I'm always interested in in dream elements, uh, real reality, reality, reality is not something I think I would do well, like contemporary, certain contemporary plays. Beckett would appeal to me, Pinter, because they're kind of a little askewed out of reality. Um, but I, I never know where the impulse really comes from. I really trust, after years of working in movement, which is nonverbal, I kind of intuit moments and they just come like a cartoon with <laughs> little bubbles and I don't think about them a lot. I do my homework and then I just go roam. But and I think raise. but I but I think it's also very important in your work that you that you do your homework. I mean so much of what I we do saw, a lot of homework. So much of what we saw here, the, the, the visual iconography of the work yeah. comes straight out of um, Vienna or Bosch's out of work. painters yeah. that we can that we can that we can identify as well. Um, and, and I've also heard you say in the past that you think that space, space is really your secret weapon, that, 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 yeah. that, and depth. Well, I think there's great in storytelling in the use of space. I mean, when I directed a play at the National Theatre in London several years ago, 
And I had not really worked with actors, it was around 94, that much. They were very intimidating for me. And there was a little interview on the BBC about what the process, and one of the actors said, she, by working with me in space, they achieved the same thing as text analysis. Um, that the distance of something, the way a shoulder will be, the back, the back of a neck, which you wrote me recently. But um, yeah, I do think space and light are my two favorite things to work with. Do you think spatially when you write? Often no, I, it's rhythms. It's, it's, a, it's all about, it's about and language I think, and rhythms. I think beats and silences, and the, the silences are a big part of angel music. Because as Martha said recently, it's very true, so there's something about beautiful shaker furniture that has a silence to it. You don't have to chat a lot. The things. empty spaces of shaker architecture. So there are, this is not a piece where, although there is text and some dialogue, it's not a piece where people, people are busy picking up cues and uh, it has its own rhythm. There's a lot of silence in the piece also. And a lot of darkness. Yeah. As well. The lighting designer is Chris Ackerman, who's a genius, and it looks to me like Vermeer. I hope you'll be able to get that. With the so Vermeer and Whistler's mother. And yeah. Let's um, let's open this up. I wish, I wish we could see your faces, but maybe. Can we you turn off the? Face? Ah. Hello. Ah. There. Hi. Could we could we, could we lose those? Would it be bad? <laughs> Anybody have a anything? Can we talk about lunch? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, you, you mentioned text and uh, shaker furniture, and I was going to ask you about steps for if there was any, if there was any uh, in your production. Sets. Sets. Uh, oh, sets, sets not sex. Yeah. There's. Um, <laughs> sure. You know, the, I'll tell you. This is a secret about this production. My little non-for-profit company ended up producing it. We'd done it on a dime. We bought from Lincoln Center Theater our rehearsal chairs. Um, you know, I got them down. And um, our costumes and our shoes are borrowed from the costume collection. We don't, we're like the Shakers, we don't own anything. <laughs> So it's mostly light. We did uh, manage to get enough money to put in a wooden floor because it just can't be done on Marley. You know, it just doesn't feel like the shakers on shiny plastic. This is Marley? This is Marley, yeah, the shakers. Um, we do have a wooden floor. Not a great wooden floor, it's okay. They make wooden noises. They make wooden noises with microphones, yeah. I mean now. No, when they had their color, and there was an old photograph, a group photograph of all these guys. And then I said, he, and each one of them was holding a whiskey bottle. Each one of them. They I also had, did drink, so it wasn't just spiritual wine. They, they were known they to be these heavy were into. They like cough medicine bottles, and they were like, and they were each holding, and they all looked plastered. And I asked the, one of the guys there, I said, they were outside workers, and they hired them, but, and they were allowed to. We've read that Mother Ann Lee could really nip it, <laughs> but uh, we I, we actually had a section that we took out about that because it got too biopic, too biographical. So the piece I've called it, or Alfred's heard me call this piece a tone poem about the Shakers. Well, it kind of is. I just wonder, and they did adopt children. They had. Well, we yes, have that too. Going we on. have adopted children. But what happened to them was they 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 were taken orphans and abandoned children. They were taking anybody, runaway slaves, escaped convicts, they took anybody. And they had winter shakers who were people who wanted the shelter and good meals in the winter and they would work in the winter and show up again the following but winter. But often with the children they would grow up and be 18 years old or so and they couldn't do it so they would leave. This we had that happen. There's also language in the play which is not, in the text which is not English. Yeah. Is that, what is that? It's, it's talking in tongues. It's speaking in tongues. And since, yeah. 
The interesting thing was that the young woman who's doing it is Turkish. And at first she was speaking Turkish, and she slid over into, I didn't know, I don't know whether you knew when she did it or not, but she slid over into tongues. I didn't realize she wasn't still speaking. Yeah. And so yeah. she, but she just improvises that. Improvises. And we have a, a young man who, he, I think he's speaking Gaelic, isn't he? Yeah. The Lord's Prayer in Gaelic. <laughs> but, we, have, we have five nationalities in an 11 member company. It's nice. How much will the um, <coughs> collaboration influence what you do from this point on? Oh, we'd love to think of another one. You mean for us? As you go your separate ways after this. It, it'll make, I hope it'll I work. I imagine you. we'll find another. Well, no, but, but in, your, in your own work, in I think the question is. It's going to uh -huh. make me be looser, I think, which is great. I love it. And it's going to make Martha more brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you. it's like making a garden path as you lay stones down. They stay with you. So whatever, I can't verbalize it yet because I'm not free of it yet. But I do start a new piece January 4th. Which is? At La Scala. I'm doing a evening of Italian rock and roll <laughs> with the ballet company of La Scala. It's a little daunting, honestly, but I think I'll get into it. It's the first time rock and roll's been at La Scala, and I can't figure out why they ask me except that I can tell a story and do sexy, maybe. <laughs> you, um, you're working with both actors and dancers in this piece, and there are very few choreographers in this country, at least, who, who really have a foot both in theater and in the dance world as much as you do. Do you find the process of working with dancers very different from actors? Do they come with yes. very different assumptions about what it means to work and how they're going I to create? I think they cross-pollinate in a really beautiful way. They get very excited about working together in the same space. Dancers are very intuitive and instinctive and they don't want to be talked at a lot. Uh, actors can never get enough talk. You know, it's a mother's milk. So in that way, and understanding and reinterpreting, maybe if I do this line this way. I mean, in a way, the process is it's like a Rorschach test. It's the same thing, but they just come at it differently. So your job is different. Yeah, and I love both. And I feel if I do too much of one thing, then I begin to get hungry for the other. And so I have been very blessed in that I get an opportunity to work with both. But they, they seem to find these, because nine of the 11, I believe nine, had never spoken on a stage before. Or some. Or I some. didn't even know they could sing. But they all, they've used this, I think, I'm out of my element here, they use the same techniques that they use to dance to get inside of themselves to speak. And it's not performing. I mean, I, I just said to them every day, every day, all the time, you're a character. You're this guy. You're this woman. That's who you are. And these people, if you look at them, the whole, what is it, an hour and ten minutes or something, that this is going on, they are all acting all the time. They're sitting in chairs but they, or walking around or hopping, but when you see them, the way they were, they've got these stories going on, some of which I don't even think you and I know. They've got all this oh, stuff. Oh, yeah, going. which is good. They've got all this <laughs> stuff going on. Yeah. Because they're, they always were performers. And one thing dancers have, that actors don't usually have is they're completely comfortable with their bodies. So they're just out there. And they're not thinking, oh, what do I look like? And this costume makes me have a big ass or anything like that. They just are loose and they just have transferred that into speaking. It's, it's exciting. Can I ask you a question along those lines? Uh, it's just about the, you said that you had a voice, a vocal coach coming in to work with the dancers. Were, were there, what type of work did that vocal coach do? A uh, man named Richard Armstrong, who teaches at NYU in the Experimental Theater, he first started working with breathing and just abstract sound, and then eventually, we've had about maybe 10 hours with him. Um, he took the text, and they had to choose the words that told the story in the text, who so really did a kind of crash course in learning to understand what they were saying, how to commit to the language, how to commit to the backstory that made the language, and they, they're they remarkable. And they all now have skills as they become older dancers. It's a more mature company, 
Our youngest is a young actor, dancer, who's in Sleep No More, who's 25, and Patrick Corbin, I think, is 46. Um, but they really have skills now to go out as the <coughs> dance career begins to be, to move on. Uh, they can, they'll be able to act and sing. There's, for instance, there's a charming French young woman who's in this piece. And so the piece she speaks is about her experience as a French immigrant. But I watch her during the show, and she's got off and got this sort of, like, oh, what's going on? And I said, so what is this? She said, well, my character, Agnès, doesn't really speak a lot of English, and she doesn't know what's going on all the time, so she's trying to figure it out. <laughs> I mean, and you see that, see that happen all the time. They had to learn to listen to each other. Uh, they, that was something that finally happened that as performers they couldn't ever drop out. It wasn't somebody else doing a pot and do a solo, you know, and so they could they don't let steam you. off. They're right there, all moments. <coughs> and it's a really close company. They have a great time together on stage, I, I hope. I think they realize that they're all of us are exploring new territory, all of us. And they're benefiting from it as much as we are. It's not just, oh boy, here we go doing the same old blah, da, da. They're doing something new and something that taxes them. Taxes all of us, I think, in ways that it hasn't before. The, the, I was, as you may or may not know, I was one of the founding members of Palabolus. And after I left, each project I do, I have look, I think, with my work, but I don't have a steady vocabulary, a certain way of lifting, there's a certain movement that comes back if people are familiar with my work. But each piece gives me the opportunity to find a new way to express. If you're doing Vienna at the turn of the century, it's different than doing Shakers in the 18th century, it's different than doing Hieronymus Bosch, and it keeps me fresh. It may not keep the audience fresh, it keeps me well, I'm thinking I'm fresh. When you, uh, when you, w when you started working, <coughs> was there, was there somebody who, um, you you looked to uh, in this in this uh, dance theatre kind of hybrid world that you exhibit? For, were there were there other artists who were working in across these two fields who seemed to be inspiration? To be inspirations. Uh, film directors more like. Um, I love Italian films from the 1950s, 60s, and 50s and 60s. I'm just a nut for really good European filmmaking. Um, Anthony Tudor was my ballet teacher, and because he was perhaps the first major choreographer to put psychology, mix it with ballet combinations, uh, he was an amazing teacher. and. His musicality and sense of theater, even in technique class, was amazing. So he continues to be an inspiration. Um, actually, it was not through dance. You know, most of it's been film. When I was a young dancer, Peter Brook's work was uh, very moving for mm -hmm. me. I was in the first workshop of Mahabharata. And I think I wanted to work with Peter Brook so badly. And when I got in, I was like about eight months too, too old for it. I'm not kidding. I got this incredible opportunity, and after two weeks of work, I said, I think I'm going to go back and do my own work because the process is very similar. And it was just like a little too late. But probably still. To be, you know, to be like this. But probably still influential. Yeah, I think painters, I mean, I'm influenced by all kinds of things. Photographs. Is, is, <laughs> there, a, is there one project that you're really burning to Three start penny working? opera. <laughs> Um, I may, I'm waiting to hear if it's going to happen next season. Why Three Penny Opera? I saw Lenya when I was 13 do Three Penny Opera. And it, I just went, that was the moment for me, was seeing that in New York at the Theater de Lis mm -hmm. when I was a very young girl. And I, I thought I wanted to be musicals, but more the Kurt Weill style. Mm -hmm. But I am really pushing for Three Penny, and I'd like to do more Shakespeare. Actually, I, Gideon and I collaborated on Midsummer Night's Dream, the play. <laughs> um, five yes, we years, did. Five, six or six, six, seven years ago. Yeah, yeah, at American Repertory Theater. And I want to do Strindberg. 
Um, Ms. Julie Badley. Okay. How about, good. How yeah. about for you, Alfred? Is there a is there a subject that you're that you're considering? Yeah, a uh, couple of things. I'm uh, I've written a play. It's a play. Play. You have a play opening at Manhattan Theatre Club. Yeah, that's an adaptation of a of a. It, it, it's a it, it's a southern play about a brother and a sister called Apples and Oranges, and I've written a play that uh, it takes place in Italy in the middle of the 19th century about a Jewish child in Bologna who was dying. He was an infant, and his Christian nurse baptized him, and he didn't die. And the parents knew nothing about all this, but the girl shot off her mouth a lot, and six years later the Papal uh, soldiers came to the house, knocked on the door, and said, it's illegal in a uh, papal state for a baptized child to live in a Jewish house, so we're taking your six-year-old. And they said, what are you talking about? He said, well, we're taking him. And they took him. And that's what it's about. Hmm. Amazing. It's an amazing story. It's true. You know it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. They never got him back. They never got him back. And um, I always say I like it because he was a worse Jew than I am, which is. Yeah, it's here. Yeah, yeah, well, very much. Um, are there any other questions, things you'd like to ask? Yes. I have one question: is I watched the videos and thought about the case a lot and whatever. Um, to what extent is it ironic? I don't want to say critical. How are we? Or what is your intent? Rapturously. Well, I know. I read the book. I intend to do that. But I think, for me, the suspense is, is this for real? Or are you playing it straight? I mean, obviously, you're respectful. But is there, is there an ironic undertone to it? Are we supposed to roll our eyes? Are we supposed to say, are these people at the other string wonderful? Um, where, how are we, or what are I, I think you're trying to say what's the message? Not what the message is, but. I don't think we're trying to, sh I think what we you're playing it did, straight. yeah, we're oh, playing yeah. it straight. We made it with the performers. It is the, the sum of all these elements coming together. I think it's very harsh. Uh, I just started reading The Great Divorce, um, which is about a, New England woman whose husband was a bit abusive and he kind of found the light in a Shaker community. Um, it's a pretty interesting book, but I talked to Alfred this morning and I said we really hit it. From what I'm reading that she, it's a very harsh, difficult mm -hmm. thing to give up natural impulse. And they were very, very strict, particularly after Ann Lee died. The Shaker community became codified We've taken about 50 years of Shaker history and, and made it into this piece. But we, I think I, I admire and love the Shakers and at the same time a little, a little appalled by it all. I would say that uh, <laughs> we're, we're dealing with extreme human behavior, mm -hmm. but it is human. And well, it's that's something, wonderful. And that's what fascinated me to begin with. And that's it's certainly not eye rolling. It's certainly not. Pastiche. I mean, you, if if we did have Eskimos coming in and talking in tongues and Christopher Columbus dancing, then it would be silly. I mean, <laughs> we could have done that, but we chose not to. Women died in childbirth so easily then, and there was a great deal of kind of a kind of extreme spirituality to understand disease and death and. Um, it reminds me at times of the crucible when I'm looking at it. Um, I mean, sex was something that nobody took off their clothes for anything, or to wash or anything. It was a different world. So we didn't have all this pornography for eight-year-olds to watch on television, I mean, or read about. So it was a very different world, but it was people who lived in it. And in my experience, people are pretty much people Sometimes they're a little whacked out, uh, but they're people, and these are people. It's a question at the back, yes. Thank you. Um, um, I'm listening to 
what you're saying, but I think you, you know, to have a great uh, three penny opera, I think you would be um, the right, um, I don't know how to say it, but um, the right people to rewrite that story and make it um, real. A three penny? Yeah. Yeah. Are you saying she's the wrong person? Hmm. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I've been hawking it around town. And I'm just waiting to hear from yet one more theater if it's on or off. <laughs> well, I don't know what you're doing. Yeah, no, I love it. And I love the music. And I'm going to see it. And I think it might be great. But I think that what you're saying and who you, I think you are and everything that's going on. But I think that it could be like uh, in, outside of everything that's, what you're talking about could be even greater than, uh, no, there are no greater than anything, but anyway, what I see is the three penny offer, and I don't even know why, but this is a gift from me to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, yes. <laughs> I hope. Um, I wanted to say when I saw it on, online that I didn't even know it was happening, I was so excited because as someone who's visited many of the Shaker villages, I, I was always quite taken by this thing of giving up sex and then the cleanliness and the order and the furniture and the music, which was exciting and quite special. And the discipline that they had in the way you did the washing and you did the cooking and they all worked together. And we would like a utopian society that can work together like that. And yet they gave up sex so they died out essentially unless they kept taking Because they didn't think about it. All they thought about was going to heaven. So if they didn't think about how we're going to survive. Well, they didn't think about the future. Right? No, they only thought about here and now. Let me get through today. And I mean, we read books about martyrs and the old Christian martyrs right. who would live in the woods and St. Gregory and whoever they were. And they would beat themselves with thorns and then they would have wet dreams and they'd have to beat themselves harder with more thorns. and. Fight that there was also a time that they thought the world was coming to an end. It was probably an eclipse. It was oh, called yeah. Dark Day. I was raised much, much later, but as a German Lutheran, and that heaven and hell thing was still very, very strong. So yeah. I understand that. But I just want to say I'm so glad that you did this. The bit that I've seen, I'm so excited. Mm -hmm. and, it's great. Um, Thank you. I can't wait to see it. Thank well, you. Thank the you. video was just not enough. <laughs> so I'm very excited. Oh, about terrific. It. Thank you. Goodness. That seems to be a that seems to be a good note on which to finish. And there's anybody. There's one more question. Yeah. It just seemed odd to me that it was so um, you know, it was seems to me as an utterly pathological expression of, of a sick culture as just another phenomenon. You know, this it was the end result or part of a thousand years. just another another form of human behavior. It's, you know, like the penis word wearing cannibals of East Timor are also just another form of human behavior. But there's something that we think is bizarre and probably wrong about it. Uh, I think you're overstating the case for the Shakers. I think the Shakers were enormously productive people. They were totally uh, men and women of, were of total equality. They respected each other, they loved each other, they worked together, and they had remarkable things. They invented the clothespin, they invented uh, the round saw, the, the flat broom, and the seed seeds. catalog. <laughs> they, the they were amazingly the productive people. They weren't, the the yeah. they weren't outwardly fixated on what you're saying. But the total formula for sterility and annihilation. Utterly, totally wrong. Well, and whatever product, product they, they I, have was totally narcissistic, focused totally on themselves. Well, then you know, don't be ashamed. And 
would doom humanity to extinction immediately. Well, I think, Ann Lee, and I think they knew that everybody in the world wasn't going to do this. I, I don't think Ann Lee ever thought that she It is a very strange world. Have you read a lot about it? It's fascinating. I mean, I, can't, I'm, I should be moving on now, and I'm still reading about it. So um, it's a pretty interesting world. And they're very admirable in the fact that they were pacifists. It was matriarchal during the American Revolution. Yeah, the no sex thing was pretty wacky, but there are other, they're not the first religion to. <laughs> Salvation, as the Lutheran lady at the end of the first row was talking about. The whole question of European society for a thousand years was how to achieve salvation and escape this hideous, doomed life. That was what was going on in Europe for a thousand years, and this is part of one of the bizarre aberrations of that near the end. Not the only bizarre aberration, but the whole history is a bizarre thing about viewing life as being a hideous, doomed, gloom and doom transition where your only obligation is to try to find some way to but achieve that's salvation and escape this world. That's Shankers thought of everything in terms of light. Light. That they light and gift. Their arm gestures was receiving gifts. So they felt very upbeat and positive about the life they had chosen. Except that they were unwilling in any way to recreate it. So a fundamental <laughs> suicide. We're not, but we're not there. We're not there to talk to the Shakers. We got fascinated in, as a subject. Yeah. We're not. We're not pro Shaker particularly. Right. So what you're saying is anybody that doesn't want to have children is some pathological person. Well, this is an ideology you're talking about, not an individual. A no. religion. It almost, you know, marriage to Christ and all that stuff. There's a lot of that going on. I, I included this as part of that pathological tradition. And yet, this is a and yet this is a sect that also produced uh, objects of enormous beauty and were aesthetically as influential as any other American uh, artists to uh, to aesthetics in the in the 20th century. But in terms of an ideology, it's not just that. There's an ideology, there's a religion. But this is, but this is an artistic, religious. but this is, this is an artistic response uh, to, uh, this is not a, this is not a documentary. Um, this is not a, this is not a. And we're not converting. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Martha has quoted with that. I didn't think so. <laughs> this Martha has gotten very drunk on spiritual wine. <laughs> <laughs> Why did I not think so? <laughs> Any other questions before we Oh, we could, that's a very good. We got to end with that. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all so much for coming, and particularly thank you to Alvin and Martha. And we can't wait to see the show. Thank you.